Thank you for uh, your uh, fidelity. So the, today's lecture will be about uh, defective manifolds. I am a defective person, so I like to speak about various defects. To be precise, second defective. But I haven't forget that I owe you some three lemmas, right? Uh, from, from the last. And uh, actually I arranged thing, things like uh, uh, this way because I wanted to explain those lemmas and I need the geometry of the second, uh, of the <coughs> second variety. And uh, I asked you if you are familiar with the second variety and your eyes were so full of enthusiasm that I think uh, it's better that I recall some, right? Correct? So, okay. So, uh, second variety. So what's all about? Let me recall you, this is a context we work with, always fixed. Smooth, non-degenerate, blah, 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 dimension n, co-dimension c. Okay. Now, you can do the following, how to call it, correspondence. So you take the product x times x times pn, right? You have here a projection. And you also can project on x, you remark. Here, actually, you have two projections, but it won't matter which you take, so I put the arrow in the middle, <laughs> meaning that if you take the first of the se or the second projection, won't change anything. This is uh, the projection to Pn, and here you have your correspondence, and this is uh, called Sx. Maybe I should move here. So this is made of points x, x prime, uh, y, such that y belongs to uh, the line determined by x, x prime. Maybe I write like this. And to be precise, let's do it this way. Sorry, the, this should be put here. Because what you do is you consider two distinct points on x, right? And then you take the line determined determined by, by these two points, and you consider all points on this line, right? And in order to have something closed, you take the closure because the two points may be uh, infinitely near, so you have seconds and tangents, right? Okay? And this is uh, called the second bundle or something. Don't, I don't want to call it. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, uh, pi, and this <coughs> is phi. And uh, the second variety, by definition, is just a projection of this second bundle in Pn. Okay? So, geometrically, this is the locus of points lying on seconds and their limits, that is tangents. Okay? Okay. So what is obvious here is that the dimension of the second bundle is just 2n plus 1. Right? Because here you have couples of points, so 2n, and over each couple of points you have a line. So here, dimension 2n plus 1. When you project, the dimension may decrease. So in general, the dimension of the second variety is 2n plus 1 minus something, which may be 0 or positive. And this delta is called the second defect. Right? And the uh, obvious definition, x is second defective
if this delta is positive. Okay? So when the second variety has dimension less than expected. Okay? That's uh, typical in algebraic geometry. You have a situation when you have an expected dimension and the real dimension is usually smaller. can be smaller, but this is considered to be a, an exceptional case, and indeed it is. Perfect. Also, some remarks. So, the second variety is in Pn. So, this implies that the dimension is smaller or equal than n which may also be read as delta bigger or equal, so this n, let me remind you, is n plus c. So delta bigger or equal n minus c plus 1, right? Right? Moreover, equality holds. means that the second variety fills up the whole ambient projective space. Okay? This is trivial, I mean nothing. Good. Now looking at this diagram, I'd like to say something about the fibers of this map. Hmm? And to do so I will introduce the following, first a small contract, um, construction and then a definition. So consider why a general point on the second variety. Okay, so let's draw a picture. So this is a second variety and I take a general point. And here you have x which is of course smaller thing inside and uh, you can uh, consider all the seconds through this uh, point and you see you can consider the cy to be cone of all seconds through y and what is very important is its trace on x, which I will denote by sigma y of x. This is called the entry locus of uh, x with respect to y, general point. And we have entry, entry because <laughs> it's it's clear because it's the locus where the seconds entry inside x, right? Uh, right? So here you fix the point on the second variety, so you have second through this point, right? And the set of points where they entry <laughs> in 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 in, uh, in x is the entry locus, right? Okay. And now if you look at this diagram and uh, you remark that the fiber of phi over some point may be seen as a closed subscheme in x times x, right? But if you project on x, this won't change the dimension because here you have couples of points, but one point determines the other because this one is fixed and they are collinear. You understand what I want to say. So that's the reason why the dimension of the entry locus is delta. And of course, consequently, the dimension of the cone is one more delta plus one. Okay? Okay? So what I'm trying to say is that here, here you have dimension 2n plus 1, right? 
the dimension of the second variety, which is the image here, is 2n plus 1 minus delta, right? This means exactly that general fibers of phi are delta dimensional, right? When seen in x times x, but if you project to x, the dimension is still delta because this projection at the level of the fibers is finite because uh, of what I told you. Okay. This is fixed, so if you fix one point, the other points are finitely many because they are the points in which this line intersects x. And the line is not contained in x because y is general, so it is in Sx minus x, right? So that's obvious. Uh, to be precise here, I mean pure, pure, pure dimension, right? Because it is a general fiber. The general fiber, these are irreducible. This is irreducible because the base is irreducible and fibers are irreducible. So the image is irreducible. And, you know, general fiber between two uh, varieties is uh, of pure, it is not irreducible in general, but it is of pure dimension equal to the difference. And that's exactly what I wrote down. So this entry locus will play an important role in what we shall uh, talk about uh, today. OK? Questions? Everything fine? I'm collecting facts that I will use for the, OK, maybe some, some more remarks. More remarks. So the first one is that these defective, so defective, second defective <coughs> manifolds uh, fall into two classes. So first of all, those for which Sx is not Pn, right? These are exactly those, what was the uh, first use of the second variety? Remember, this was the uh, first uh, uh, lesson in uh, algebraic geometry. Whenever the second variety does not fill the whole ambient projective space, you can project isomorphically your variety in a lower dimensional projective space simply by taking a point outside the second variety. Then, obvious, right? the projection will be an isomorphic. So these are so these are manifolds admitting non trivial projections. Why non trivial? Why non trivial? Because you always can project isomorphically up to 2n plus 1, 2 times the dimension plus 1, right? Which is the expected dimension of the uh, second variety, right? When you can project more than that, for instance, any surface can be projected to, projected to P5, right? When you can project to P4 or even to P3, then you have a miracle, right? And this is exactly saying that the defect is positive. You can project more than expected. Clear? The other situation does not concern uh, <coughs> projections because the second variety fills up the whole space, but nevertheless, it is very interesting. Can you tell me why? Compute. If this is so, and the variety is defective, what does this mean? This means that n equals 2n plus 1 minus delta. Okay? Now, if you compute, this will tell you exactly that n is at least c. So, this means the variety has small codimension. So, delta positive, right? So here, this is n plus c, 2n plus 1 minus delta. So uh, delta is n uh, minus c plus 1, and it is positive, right? Positive, so exactly this. 
it has small good image. So you can see that the geometry of the second variety certainly is related to the fact that we have small code image and vice versa. Okay? Agreed? Hmm? So, if you want, there are two sources of interest. First of all, we, these uh, lovely uh, unexpected projections, right? If they exist, well, and then this small co-dimension, which was one of our favorite themes, right? And the second remark, which is a striking experimental fact. So, in all examples we know about if second variety is not Pn, then delta is not too large. To be precise, delta is at least 8. This is something that baffles everybody. Why it is so, only God knows so far. We don't know. Maybe we are so stupid, we are unable to construct intelligent examples. But maybe there is something deep. And if this would be a theorem, you must admit this would be quite extraordinary. So you cannot project non-trivially more than eight times. Where does this eight come from? Oh, baffling. Baffling and extremely intriguing. These are difficult problems. I, I'm not suggesting you to think about this. Huh? But anyway, saying there is something miraculous uh, in the backyard is uh, quite uh, interesting, I think. OK. These were the facts I wanted to recall. And now I will prove two of the three lemmas that I owe you. Because uh, now I have the terminology. Maybe some, maybe, maybe let me give now some more definitions before, uh, be, before uh, passing to the proofs, because uh, this will be useful for the uh, next things we do. So let us look at this uh, situation in which the cone of seconds intersects, intersects uh, our variety x in this entry locus. And then we see that uh, understanding second defective manifolds is quite difficult, but maybe we can imagine a situation in which these objects are the simplest possible. So let us make some rhetoric question which are the simplest second defective manifolds. So any guess? Uh, it's not easy, but it's not complicated either. Because here, uh, you have a natural context in which you have a cone, right? It's a cone of seconds. Now you may ask yourself, which is the simplest cone? Now any geometer will answer that, so I'm waiting. Which is the simplest cone? No geometers in this room. Oh, that's very sad. With one exception, of course. So, let me repeat. Of all cones, you know what a cone is, right? So you have a point and a distinguished point, so to say, such that for any point different from that point, the line determined by the fixed point and the given point is completely contained in the variety. So question, among all cones you know, 
Is there one which is uh, the simplest? Yes. The situation in which you can take at this vertex any point. So this is a linear space. Right? A linear space. So a first guess could be, and actually it's correct, that the simplest possible second defective varieties should be those for which the cone of seconds through the general point is linear. So, take C, Y, right? Linear. Okay. Well, now, one simple, uh, so, to simplify matters, assume also that the codimension is not one. Because for hypersurfaces, there is no mystery. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there is second variety. The whole project is based in a trivial way, you know. They, they are, but if you want, we can put here uh, this uh, trivial fact. So what do we know about this delta? Hmm? It can be zero, well, and it can be maximal, right? Well, delta equal n is the same, think just a moment, as saying that x is a hypersurface. Right? So, when x is a hypersurface, so, well, because then the, the dimension of the second variety is n plus 1, right? So, <laughs> x is a hypersurface, uh, clearly. And uh, so, this case is, uh, is too simple, so I, I will exclude it. So now, that's a more intelligent question. Assume this cone to be linear. Now my question is, what is the entry locus? Assuming that it is not a hypersurface, because when it is a hypersurface, this cone will certainly be linear. It's, uh, it's, it's everything, and then the, the entry locus is the whole variety, and well, it's uh, too trivial to to be. So assume this, and then my question is, what is sigma y in this case? Can you answer? You need an important theorem in projective geometry, and uh, certainly my friend Professor Quark taught you this, because he is using this result uh, each five minutes of his life. So now, what is the important remark? The entry locus has dimension delta, right? The cone over it has dimension delta plus one. So the entry locus is a hypersurface in this linear space, CY, right? Now, my question is what this hypersurface is? And the answer is a quadric. What is the famous result I was referring to? The, it is called the trisecond lemma. The trisecond lemma tells you that the general second is not a trisecond unless your variety is a hypersurface. What does this mean? This means that if x is not a hypersurface, otherwise if you take any line, it will cut the hypersurface in d points, where d is its degree. So there is not counted with multiplicity. So there is nothing you can do, right? But if it is not a hypersurface, the general second will meet the variety only in two points. So it is not a three second. Three second, of course, meaning that it meets in at least three points counted properly. Okay, so this is uh, so that so answer. It is a hyperquadric by three second lemma.
okay. So hopefully this will justify the following definitions that uh, we worked together with Rousseau, which in turn were suggested by some work by Fyodor Zak that uh, will be recalled soon. So definitions, x is, there are three definitions. The first is Q Q E L. This is an abbreviation for quadratic entry locus. If uh, sigma y x is a quadric of dimension, of course, delta, for y general point in the second variety. Okay. So these are certainly the simplest second defective manifolds because the entry locus is the simplest possible, a quadric. Because the column of seconds is the simplest possible, a linear space. Done? This definition has one drawback. It is not preserved by isomorphic projection. When you, for instance, you take the Veronese surface in P5, right? Obviously, it is uh, QL because if you take two points, there is a line joining them. You are in a projective space. But this line is actually a conic because you have taken the second Veronese embedding, right? So the line becomes a conic. So there is a conic through two general points. And so uh, this is easily seen to be the anti locus. Okay? When you project it, project it to P4, which is possible, actually the only one, as we shall see, when you project it, this conic uh, becomes three conics. Why? Because the second variety of the Veronese surface is a cubic threefold in P5. And when you project, three points will come together. And then you'll have three conics. You understand? So the entry locus will become more complicated, meaning instead of being one conic, it will be three conics. So to correct this, we introduced this L, L meaning local quadratic entry locus, which means for any two points, general points, there exists a quadric of dimension delta containing x and containing the point, the two points. So, let me kindly point out that here, so I took a general point, right? And I take a general second. A general second will join two general points, right? X, X prime, right? So the entry locus, can I help? The entry locus is a sub-variety of X, which can be very complicated. So there are extremely few results about the structure of the entry locus in general. It can be reducible, it can have many components, all are of dimension delta, but that's all we know. You have read Zivran, is one of the best experts in the world for understanding the general structure of the entry locus, but there is very few such. <laughs> it's very co in general, we don't know. But what we know is that the entry locus is something that may be reducible, which connects two general points. Right? By definition, because you take two general points, you take the second determined by it, 
you take a point somewhere on this second and you apply this construction and you see right but you cannot be sure that there is one irreducible component of the entry locus joining the two points they may lie on different components right so in general it's a mess okay now in the simplest case this is a quadric so it is irreducible right so you have some decent variety joining two general points actually this would lead to the fact that such varieties are rationally connected meaning you know if you have a quadric you have two points you can join them by a conic just take this line and cut with hyperplane containing it until you get a conic possibly reducible but it, there is a conic right and so they are rationally connected and the whole Morris theory applies so this will be let's say a hint of how to study these objects okay now this is we have this implication moreover uh, <coughs> moreover I make the following remark here just before giving the last and uh, the last definition remark is that uh, if exists a quadric joining two general points then its dimension is at most delta so here local quadratic antilocus means there is a quadric through two general points and its dimension is the maximal possible why is it so simple look take two general points take a quadric of any dimension right now take the span of this quadric this will be a linear space of dimension one more right but now in this span any line will cut this quadric in two points so the quadric is in, in the entry locus and the dimension of the entry locus is delta so the dimension of the quadric is at most delta the is contained in the yes 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 this quadric contained in x of course of course of course as a wise there is a quadric through any two points i mean yeah. okay okay so this explains somehow the last definition which is the largest and which actually appeared already this is conic connected which means exists conic contained in x and joining two general points right and now by the previous remark if you have a conic now you have two general points you have a conic take the plane of the conic any line contained in this plane will be a second right so take a point in that plane outside the conic and look at the pencil of lines through the point right these are all seconds passing through the point so what can I say about a conic connected uh, manifold it is defective it has defect at least one because you the conic is in the anti locus and the dimension of the anti locus is that okay so you see so this implies second effect so this is kind of a hierarchy in which these are the simplest possible these are a natural generalization these are a strong generalization and here we have all of them which we cannot unfortunately dream to understand because they are too complicated right Okay, now I finished with uh, preparations and uh, I think I will erase everything. If there are questions,
And now I, I'm ready to go back to the lemmas that uh, I owe you. <coughs> and uh, I have also prepared the way for the next lecture. I think that uh, most of the definitions have been already given, which is good news. Okay, now let's see the first lemma. The first lemma I used uh, in the previous talk had the following uh, statement. So uh, I, I don't use x because I applied the lemma to Lx, so I use y. Okay? It's not important. So y in some projective space was a complete intersection. Okay? Complete intersection. And the dimension was at least co-dimension minus 1, if I'm not wrong. And my statement was that the second variety is the whole, the whole space. Right? I applied this to Lx to deduce some nice things and to apply the Huang Quebecus theorem that was second lemma, which will be proved in a few minutes. Okay? Let's see this because it is very instructive. It gives you one of the main remarks which are at the basis of this kind of reasoning. So let's prove this. So proof. The proof relies on uh, another correspondence. So there are two very, very important correspondences. One is the one defining the second variety that was written here some minutes ago. The other is the one defining the dual variety. It is the correspondence in which you look at all tangent hyperplanes. Tangent hyperplane means contains the tangent plane, uh, the tangent space at that point. Okay? So, we are re this is called the conormal variety in the literature. So, the conormal variety of Y is made of the following thing. So here you take points Y and hyperplanes H such that the tangent space at Y, Y, this is a projective tangent space, is contained in the hyperplane. Where is this correspondence situated? Of course, in the product of Y with a dual projective space, because uh, hyperplanes are points in the dual projective space, right? Okay. Now, this has a projection uh, to the dual projective space, and the image is by definition the dual variety. I shall talk about this later on. For the moment, leave it. And of course, it has a projection, so this is uh, one projection, and here you have the other projection. And this is uh, what I'm talking about. And now, now you can do easily you can easily see the dimension of this guy. So claim dimension of the conormal variety is just n minus 1. So 1 less the dimension of the ambient projective space. How do you see this? Well, trivial. You take a point in Y. What is the fiber? The fiber consists of all hyperplanes containing the tangent space there. So this is of dimension what? Co-dimension minus 1, right? So plus n, this is capital N minus 1, OK? But you can do, you can do more. You, you can, so this is a P uh, C minus 1 bundle over Y, right? You can be more precise. 
you, you can tell exactly which is the bundle. And the answer is, this is an uh, easy exercise, but you, I won't do it. This is a projective bundle associated to the normal bundle of the variety, but twisted with minus one. And this project is a Grotendieck project, not the classical project. <laughs> Just not to confuse. Uh, so Grotendieck, so you work with hyperplanes, not with uh, lines, right? When you define it. Hyperplanes, not lines. So this is just the projective bundle associated to this vector bundle, right? This is one of the cornerstones of projective geometry. This, this correspondence is extremely important. And then this map, this map, this projection here is given by O of 1. So this, this call it also phi, so not 2. So phi is given by, let's call it OP1, right? So the tautological bundle here, okay? Good. This was crucial for the lemma. And now the proof comes easily because we shall combine two things. First of all, so Y was supposed to be a complete intersection. So Y, complete intersection. Then you know something about the normal bundle. A complete intersection, say, of degrees D1, Dc, right? So transversal intersection of hypersurfaces, uh, you abbreviate this by giving only the degrees, right? Say D1, Dc. What do you know about the normal bundle? Because this is a transversal intersection, this is a direct sum, right? So the normal bundle, of course, is just sum of OY of these DIs, right? Right? Okay. But I have to twist this guy by minus 1. So this is DI minus 1, right? But now, what do you know about the variety? It is non-degenerate, right? So what can you tell me about these DIs? They are at least two. So DI minus one is at least one. So what is the conclusion about this bundle? Ample. Good. Thank you. This is ample. Ample. Actually, when you want to prove such a lemma, the only important thing here is not that it is a complete intersection, but the much weaker fact that normal bundle twisted by minus 1 is ample, which is automatical for a complete intersection, which is non-degenerate, as I just explained. Is this clear? So far. Okay. Now, my friends, what can you tell me about this map. So if this is ample, then the map phi from the conormal variety to the dual is how? What was the definition of a vector bundle being ample? The definition was take the approach and the O of 1, the tautological, is ample as a line bundle. Right? Right? So how is this map? Because it is defined by some ample line bundle. It is finite. Right? So what we get from here is that this is finite. This is the crucial information. Finite, in particular, means it has finite fibers, right? You have had a difficult night, right? <laughs> and this was nothing, but it is followed by a difficult day. <laughs> okay. 
right? And now, how can I get to the conclusion? So far, the second variety is not visible. You see? We have this beautiful uh, correspondence that constructs the dual, and uh, this is finite, very well, but the second variety is not in the game as yet. Now remember, because this is a, a, a super, 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 super useful technique. Look how it enters into the game. It enters into the game through some classical lemma, which now I will state, which is uh, very, very, very useful. So useful. I think it's a single L. Classical lemma, which I won't prove. It is elementary. Completely, you will find it in any book. Non-trivial, but elementary. So this lemma bears the name of his inventor, an Italian guy called Terracini. What is his lemma? the content of his lemma. Very, very nice. So take y general point on the second variety and consider the second. So here you have y and here you have x, x prime, its intersection. This is the entry locus. Okay. Okay, then Terracini describes the tangent space, so this is general, so this is a smooth point in particular, right? So I want to understand the tangent space at the point Y of the second variety. Hmm? As a projective space, so all tangent spaces are projective, so you, you take the closure. And Terracini tells you it is important, two things are important. One, that the points are general, and two, characteristic zero. Otherwise, you have counterexamples. Characteristic zero. And uh, I think the, the, what was the name of the, of the, uh, see John, what was the name of the Japanese guy that was doing uh, these things in characteristic P? He, Kachi, yeah. It was uh, he and one of his students, yeah. right? If you remember, yeah. in uh, in the col colloquium for for Zach's uh, birthday. Kachi and the student uh, of him. Uh, I don't remember the name. Furukawa. Yes, exactly. So uh, they are looking at this uh, subject in characteristic P, but in in characteristic zero, things are uh, nice due to this lemma, which is of fundamental importance. And the description is very geometrical and as you will see in, in five minutes, extremely useful. This tangent space is the join of the tangent space at x in the point x and in the point x prime. Extremely nice and easy to remember. So look, So you take a general second. Here you have the two collision points. Here you have a general point. And you want to understand this big, this big uh, projective space, which is the tangent space at this point to the second variety. And the answer is you take the tangent space here, tangent space here, you make the join. As a corollary. What dimension has this guy? Well, this is a general point, so it is smooth. So this is of dimension 2n plus 1 minus delta, right? This is of dimension n, this is of dimension m. If you read this in terms of elementary linear algebra kindergarten, you get that the dimension of the interse intersection of the tangent spaces, that's how Italian guys well, thinking. At two general points is just delta minus one. 
it's another way of expressing uh, Terracini's lemma, right? It's minus one because you take projective. So when you apply the formula for vector spaces, you add one, and there is a one uh, appearing. Okay? So being, so people, this is very important. Saying that a variety is second defective is the same as saying that at two general points, the tangent spaces meet. Which is not obvious. I mean, and uh, this comes from Terracci. Because the definition of defective was with the second variety. Here you don't see the second variety, right? Any two general points, tangent space is projective, of course. They should meet. And this is equivalent. The more they meet, the more defective the variety is. Equivalent. Exactly. Questions? Everything fine? Good. Now we know about Terracini, and we can give the clue which is the link between second defect and entry locus and this stuff and this diagram, which is apparently of a completely different nature. It, it has something to do with the dual projective space. You say, OK, now here the mystery will be revealed. Because what do you do? Now look. The proof is by contradiction. I want to prove this, OK? Let's assume it's not like this. So maybe I will uh, go here. I will finish in a line, but uh, this is quite significant. And that's why I'm insisting this is a very crucial point. So assume. The, this is different. OK. Take a point general. Take a hyperplane containing the tangent space at that point. So notice that the existence of such a hyperplane comes from the fact that this is, if it is equal, <laughs> this, this will be equal to Pn when there is no hyperplane, right? You understand? OK, so you have a hyperplane there. Now, by that Terracini what do you get? You get that, that so keep the notation, so uh, second general second through y meets x in x x prime, right? The same picture that I had. So Terracini tells you that this guy is contained in H because it is contained in this guy, right? If you want, I can write like this. Right? OK. Now, define C of H. This is called contact locus of a hyperplane H. to be the set of points x in x such that the tangent space at that point is contained in H. Right? So you have a variety, you have a hyperplane, you look at the points where the tangent space is contained in the hyperplane. How can you describe this geometrically? What is this set? the compact locus. <coughs> it is a set of, I begin and you finish the question. It is a set of singular points of the intersection between H and X, right? 
a point in the intersection will be singular exactly when the tangent point to x will be contained in h, right? Right? So this is exactly the singular locus of the intersection between h and x. Correct? Right? Good. Now, let us see what we have done. Here, what was x? Well, x, how I arrived at x? So, the crucial, crucial remark is this. Sigma with an usual notation. Then I explain. So, whenever a hyperplane contains the tangent space at a point general point of the second variety it contains the sigma locus the entry locus with respect to that point that's what I have proved if you see so I've taken such a point I assume the hyperplane contains this right and this x is any point in the in the entry locus right so you have the entry locus here you have y right then you take any point and uh, you have this, right? And then by Terracini, the tangent space at this point stays in the tangent space at Y, which stays in H. So, 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 any point here has to be here. Right? Now I finished. Why? Let's see, so till now, this condition was not used, right? I only used this. Now I use this. This, remember, my delta, it was written here, delta is at least n minus c plus 1, right? With equality, if and only if the second variety is the, the whole term. This is tri but triviality. But here, n minus c plus 1 is bigger equal than 0. But it should be strictly greater. Sorry. Here, I cannot have equality because equality holds exactly when the second variety fills up n. And I assume by contradiction this is not the case. Right? So, hypothesis plus the assumption says delta positive. Right? Uh -huh. So the dimension of the entry locus is positive. Right? But then the dimension of the contact locus of this hyperplane is positive. Because this is contained in this, it's a fortiori, right? my h, this hyperplane that I'm working with here. Okay? Stop. Stop. My a hyperplane h is a point here. What is the contact locus? The set of points such that the tangent space stays inside. So this is exactly the fiber of this map over the point. And I proved that it has positive dimension. Contradiction with the fact that the map was finite. End of story. Okay, questions? So this lemma has been explained in full detail. Yeah, that's uh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the yeah. connect to the 
distance. Yeah, yeah, to connect, that's a, that's a crucial idea. Yeah. You have to look at the contact locus of a hyperplane and to remember that this is always containing the entry locus. And that's how you connect the two things that were different, the second variety and the dual variety, if you want. And this is quite deep. And it appears many, many times. Okay, everybody happy? Questions? No. Questions? Yes. And uh, this equality just for general, general. It's enough. It, it's enough because it, if you take it general, you, you get dimension delta, right? One content is always true. Yes, yes, yes. It's the other. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. But this is uh, irrelevant. I mean, the proof is okay. Okay? Now I will prove the Juan Quebecus theorem, but this is of a completely different flavor. It's, uh, another, it's another game. 